Hello, I'm David Kerr, Director of Communications for the Diocese of Lansing, and this is of course the month of June, and a cursory glance across the flagpoles of the United States can tell you that for many people in this country and beyond, June has come to denote what's known as Pride Month. But what is Pride Month? What does it hope to achieve? And what's a Catholic perspective on all of that? There are just some of the questions I put in the latest Diocese of Lansing podcast to Father Philip Bachansky. Father Bachansky is the Executive Director of Courage, that's a Catholic apostolate that aims to help those who are same-sex attracted to live happy, holy and integral lives in accordance with the teachings of the Church. I began by asking him though to give us a little bit of the history of Pride Month. Well, Pride Month uh, began in the uh, late 1960s, um, originally to commemorate uh, the Stonewall riots uh, that happened in in June of, I believe, 1969. Um, This was in reaction to police brutality uh, in uh, particularly the Stonewall in a a gathering spot for people who identify as uh, LGBT. Um, There were several raids on uh, on that establishment there and then um, the uh, the people in the neighborhood kind of rose up and, and protested that. And I think in, in its early days, uh, Pride demonstrations, Pride Day or Pride Week or Pride Month were, were kind of harking back to that reality and, and really pushing for civil rights, for human rights, uh, for uh, drawing attention to uh, those offenses against basic human dignity, of, uh, like uh, discriminating against people for their sexual orientation. Um, since then, it's expanded quite a bit, I think, especially in the last decade or so. Um, uh, celebrations have gotten much more elaborate um, in terms of parades, in terms of uh, television and, and internet programs. Um, there's been a big kind of um, corporate uh, buy-in to uh, Pride Month decorating corporate logos with, with rainbow uh, flags and, and other kind of symbols of the community. Um, and uh, it's it's... I think it's it's become such a uh, kind of widespread thing that it's it's hard to kind of pin down you know exactly who's there and what their agendas are. There's still some people who are, uh, I think, out there to raise visibility of LGBT people, uh, raise visibility of their civil rights, um, but others who uh, are kind of just celebrating their relationships, and others who I think, frankly, are being transgressive, just for the sake of transgressing, kind of pushing societal norms. Uh, with um, you know very provocative uh, attire, very provocative uh, displays and actions um, uh, to kind of, um, I, I don't think they necessarily represent the majority of people who are uh, who identify as LGBT certainly or who, who take part in those things, but but it has taken on that element in a lot of places as well, just kind of a celebration of of freedom or and I think we would call it from our perspective libertinism, you know that freedom that kind of is disregarding uh, any kind of moral or societal norms. Um, but in addition to the parades and the, the public demonstrations, you know, there will be uh, gatherings and, and seminars and speeches and conferences during June as well um, from various perspectives in that community. Get to the nub of this, I guess. Obviously, you, you say there's a, there's a coalition here surrounding or involved in, in Pride Month, but as a, as a generality, there's clearly a point of departure, it seems to be a point of departure between what is being claimed or asserted by Pride Month as regards um, the uh, optimal mode of behaviour in terms of human sexuality and what the church would propose in terms of the truth of human sexuality. If if I'm correct in saying that, how would you encapsulate or summarise that form of view, the view of human sexuality put forward by Pride Month, how would you then summarize the uh, the proposition of, of the church as articulated by courage uh, mm-hmm. as regards the, the truth of human sexuality and, and how do they compare and contrast, especially as regards the pursuit of, I guess, authentic human uh, happiness? There's an easy question. <laughs> well, I think, you know, if we start uh, with the origins of, of these, uh, these commemorations in, in terms of visibility and, and, and respect for human dignity, uh, I think the, the church is on the same page with that. Uh, clearly in, in the catechism of the Catholic church, uh, in the, the, the small section that refers to the church's teaching on, on the issue of homosexuality, it says that you know, we must 
understand how people uh, feel who are dealing, who are experiencing these attractions in their life. And we must receive them uh, and accept them with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Um, and actually the church goes a little, even a little farther than that. Um, uh, in a document from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in 1986, uh, they, they instructed the bishops of the world that it is deplorable that people uh, of homosexual orientation have been and are the object of violent malice in speech and in action, um, that this betrays a lack of respect for human dignity that deserves the, the condemnation of the church's pastors wherever it occurs, and that the human rights of people should be enshrined uh, in, in doctrine and in law. So um, if that's all we were talking about, then we'd be on the same page. Now, that same paragraph from, from the uh, CDF document from 1986 goes on to say, but the way to promote and respect the human rights of all people is not uh, to say that uh, everything is the same and that uh, sexual relations between people of the same sex are moral and good and no different from uh, the, the, what we call the marriage act, sexual intimacy in the context of marriage between a man and a woman, um, that that's not going to, to uh, actually get us to the point where, where we can find common ground. It, it actually uh, it draws a sharp distinction and, and is silent about the church's teaching. So, you know, the church's teaching uh, on homosexuality, um, you know, makes a distinction between the person the, uh, the desire that the person feels and the action that the person may choose to do or not to do. Um, people are always created good uh, and in the image and likeness of God. Uh, and that being created in the image and likeness of God and being created male and female gives us the context for sexual intimacy. Um, our, our loving relationships have to resemble God's love for us. And so sex is reserved for uh, a relationship that is permanent and faithful marriage based on complementarity, the particular gifts and differences between men and women, and open to the possibility of procreativity. And anything that's missing one or more of those elements, those essential elements, uh, the church judges to be immoral. Um, and so adultery, fornication, uh, uh, pornography and masturbation, uh, contraceptive sex, and homosexual acts, they're all basically considered the, the same level of wrong for the same reason, right? And in the case of homosexual acts, uh, it, they by their nature, and so the church uses the word intrinsically, by their nature, always exclude procreativity and complementarity because two people of the same sex can become one flesh and, and share the, the gift of new life. And so um, the church perceives that as disordered in the sense that the, those essential characteristics form a pattern and order of creation. And these actions are missing something. Uh, in fact, the two central things, procreation and, and, and complementarity, uh, and do so by their nature. So there's never gonna be a set of circumstances where that's going to be appropriate for human beings or lead to their flourishing. Um, and so the church has to speak clearly and say that, that those kind of sexual relations and the, and the sexual relationship that's built around it uh, are not part of God's design, they're not what God intends. At the same time, the church doesn't condemn any person for feeling attractions to the same sex. It's not a situation that people choose uh, to, not to feel a feeling. Um, we have to be responsible for the choices we make if we put ourselves in a position to be tempted, what we call the occasion of sin. Uh, and we certainly are responsible for the actions that we take if we act on those feelings. Um, but no one is to be condemned or marginalized for being same-sex attracted, uh, for uh, even for identifying as, as LGBT, um, you know, it's it's um, the the experience of, of same-sex attraction is not in itself sinful. Um, so that's our that's the kind of the church's teaching, kind of in a nutshell. Um, the reality behind it is that we're all people are called to chastity, which means integrating our desires, deciding whether to act on them not based on how strong they are, but on where they're leading and only acting on sexual desires that are directed at a person who is or could be one's spouse. And in all other cases, choosing abstinence from sexual intimacy, uh, which frees somebody up to have good friendship, to be uh, affectionate, to certainly uh, share the gift of, of charity, divine love. Um, in reality, the, the church's teaching sets people free 
uh, to live authentic relationships in all the various uh, aspects of their lives instead of saying, you know, I have to focus on this, this sexual relationship, which is not where, what God intends for me. So if you're saying that the, the path as articulated by the church and as articulated by courage, uh, for those who are same-sex attracted is the path towards, I think the word you used was uh, human flourishing mm -hmm. and, and freedom. Um, just tell us a little bit then about the, the history of this organization, Courage, as a means, as a mechanism to give that, um, I guess, al alternate path um, mm -hmm. or other option for those who are same-sex attracted? Well, Courage was founded in 1980. At the end of uh, September was our, our very first meeting in New York City. Uh, and the, the Archbishop of New York at the time was Colonel Terrence Cook. And he had met a number of people uh, who were questioning, you know, how they should, should live their lives, understanding what the church was teaching. There was a group that was founded a few years before called Dignity, uh, which uh, purported to be for gay Catholics, um, gathered them for mass and, and socializing, but, um, but rejected the church's teaching on um, the necessity of, of chastity. And so um, people had come to Cardinal Cook and, and to other priests who had, had spoken with him. And so he knew, he realized that this was a, uh, a situation that the church needed to provide some help and support. Uh, and so he, uh, he asked uh, his assistant priest, uh, uh, Father uh, Edwin uh, O'Brien, who's now Cardinal O'Brien, um, to find somebody who could take on this ministry. Father O'Brien reached out to uh, Father Benedict Rochelle, and Father Rochelle reached out to Father John Harvey. Uh, Father Harvey was an oblate of St. Francis de Sales. He had written uh, on the subject of homosexuality in the church's teaching starting in the late 50s and was really one of the few moral theologians that was writing about it from a, a perspective faithful to the church's teaching. Uh, and in the 70s, he had started retreat, a series of retreats for priests and religious brothers who experienced same-sex attraction and were, wanted to live there their chaste celibate commitment with integrity. And so he had uh, weekend and summer programs for them. Uh, so, so Father O'Brien invited Father Harvey to, uh, to come and lead this, this little group. Um, so they got together, as I said, at the end of September and uh, just to kind of talk things over and, and pray together. Uh, and then, you know, kind of really driven by the, the desire and the initiative of the members uh, the little organization started to grow. They chose, the members chose the name. Um, they had a list of, I think, 30 or 40 names, lots of different virtues that they could use as like a rallying cry. And someone suggested, well, to live any of those other things all requires courage and all requires fortitude. So that should be our name. And then um, they also, uh, over the course of the next couple of meetings, um, devised the, the five goals of courage that they would follow together. So that's still kind of our, our constitution, our, our program. So the first goal is to live chaste lives according to what the church teaches about homosexuality, uh, which means we're not an ex-gay organization. We're not doing conversion therapy. Um, you know, chastity, the church defines as integration, um, whereas some evangelical churches uh, might define it as getting rid of homosexual attractions. Um, we have a, a founding member of the group. Uh, he's now been a courage member for 40 years. And I think he'd tell you he's still experiences same-sex attraction. He's never been married, never you know, become straight, so to speak. Um, but he's learned to live a very chaste life in terms of integrating those desires, knowing what to, whether or not to act on them, et cetera. And then the other, the other four goals support the first goal. So to develop a life of prayer and dedication. Um, this is really kind of based on Father Harvey's uh, uh, Salesian spirituality from St. Francis de Sales. Um, to create an atmosphere in our groups where everyone can share their thoughts and experiences and support one another and with that, that, uh, shared, uh, that shared journey, uh, to uh, really work on fostering chaste friendships, both within the group and outside the group, uh, and then living lives that can serve as good example to other people. Um, so shortly after the group got started, the Catholic press in New York started to write about it, interview Father Harvey, word spread. Uh, I think the next chapters were in Philadelphia and Boston in 1982. And now I, we have, uh, I think, about 200 chapters in uh, 18 countries, I believe. Uh, we're in every continent except Africa, well, and Antarctica. 
uh, but uh, but we're growing in, in very much in, in Latin America and uh, in Eastern Europe at the time. Uh, so um, so we really I don't think our our founding members could have envisioned the way that it looks now. But we're still we kind of find feel ourselves kind of the just the inheritors of their their legacy, and and we still read the five goals at the beginning of every meeting, and and um, I think they would recognize a meeting even though they'd be bewildered by how big the organization has become. And obviously the, the numbers sound impressive, but what does that mean in terms of individuals, in terms of individual persons? I mean, I don't know if you can share with us being respectful of anonymity um, it, when anonymity is expected, but some of the stories, some of the lives that uh, you've come across that have been uh, impacted in a very positive way by, by your apostolate at Courage. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so there's a couple of things that come to mind. I'm trying to, to think of which ones to start with. Um, uh, I, I think one of the so there are two groups that I'm very proud of that are, are very uh, relatively new. Uh, one is uh, about two and a half years ago, um, we uh, began an online courage group uh, specifically for priests who experience same sex attraction and, and want to live. Their, their chase celibate commitment. Um, and we meet every two weeks. Uh, we have, I think, probably about, uh, about 20 priests on the, the mailing list and, and we can get anywhere from, from six to 12 of them at a particular meeting. Um, we follow all the same procedures as, as a regular courage meeting. And uh, it's really been quite a joy to, um, to work with them. You know, so I, I lead that group myself and, uh, uh, you know, just the way that they are able to be um, honest and transparent with one another, uh, the way that they support one another, uh, really encourage each other. You know, um, there's one priest that that I was talking to one on one for about two years uh, before we got this group started, and I and his spiritual director were the only two people in the world that knew that he was he had this experience of same sex attraction. He'd never been. In relationships, he never acted on it. But um, but you know, when he came to the the first online meeting, and there were uh, six other priests there, he quadrupled the number of people in his life who he could share this with, right? And and he's come such a long way, I think, uh, in terms of just being more comfortable with himself and his vocation, and and he's done a lot of growth and you know in his spiritual life, and and certainly in his in his commitment to chastity as well. So. Uh, I think that's a real been a real blessing uh, in in recent years. Um, there's I also have a, a group for um, for young people who they're they're part of an organization that uh, does evangelization and um, you know they're they're a small minority within a, you know several hundred people their age and uh, you know the 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 organization itself is really good about um, uh, about treating sexual addictions and things like that. Uh, but these young people were, you know, were coming to me. I do training for them every year, and uh, they would come to me and say, "This is great, and and I'm glad that that other group is there." But I need to be able to speak more freely, you know, with people who know where I'm coming from. And so, um, you know, so it's been about four years now that we've had an online group for for them. Um, they have you know, shared they, a lot of shared experiences formationally and 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 pastorally speaking. And so to to just watch them share this part of their life with each other and see the freedom that comes from it. Um, You know, I I have the privilege of, uh, in my job now as executive director, I'm kind of chaplain at large, so to speak. And so I visited uh, chapters around around the the country and and Canada and Mexico and um, go to retreats. And um, uh, we have regional retreats annually uh, in different places, different parts of the U.S. Um, I think one of my favorite is uh, is the, uh, the women's retreat that we have once or twice a year. Um, we don't have a lot of women in the apostolate at the moment, um, but they stay pretty well connected uh, through internet and and, uh, and phone uh, during the year. But then uh, ho- usually spring and fall, we find a central location and come together for four days or so of, of retreat. And I'm the only man there. And uh, I thought I knew what sharing uh, could be like at a, at a group, but they, they really share from their heart in a big way. Um, and so um, it's really beautiful to see them also support one another, especially because they don't generally have many women in their local courage chapter, um, but they, they make the most of those days that we have together. So those are just some of the, 
the, the, the, the, the stories that really bring me joy from, from what's going on in the apostolate today. In terms of uh, and, uh, some people listening, you know, that we're sort of alighting terminologies here, you know, sometimes the references to, to gay, sometimes LGBT, sometimes same-sex attracted. I noticed that in Courage, you tend to use the term same-sex attracted or same-sex attraction. Why is that and why does terminology matter, if indeed it does matter? Yeah, I, I would usually talk about a person who experiences same-sex attraction because I think that's the most fair way to describe a situation that varies widely from person to person and can even uh, have some variation in the course of a person's lifetime. So, you know, we put the person first, right? And instead of saying a gay man, right? It's a, he's a person first who experiences these attractions, but the attractions don't define uh, who he is. God defines who he is. He's a son of God. A brother of Christ by adoption uh, is called to a vocation. You know that's they're called by name, right? So that's that's who the person is. And um, you know, I, I think to to say that it's someone who experiences same sex attraction as opposed to uh, a person with a homosexual inclination, which is how the church uh, would uh, have referred to uh, to them in documents before this. Um, you know, makes it sound a lot less. Um, pathological, shall we say, you know, like it's not uh, even, I, I'm even careful to say, you know, a person who experiences the same sex attraction as opposed to a person who has SSA, right, um, which makes it sound like a, a psychological illness, which it certainly is not, and it's not considered that way by the church. Um, so, you know, I think there are people in the church who are faithful to what the church teaches about chastity and about um, sexual intimacy, um, who nonetheless really uh, insist on the label of gay Catholic or LGBT Catholic. Um, and will say, well, look, what I mean by that is that my, uh, my attractions uh, are shaped my personality and that I see things through this lens of quote unquote being gay. Fine, that's fine as far as it goes, right? But I mean, to say that I know what I mean when I say a word doesn't mean that I can predict what other people will hear when they hear me use that word. Uh, and it's just a fact, I think, that in the broader community, um, gay, LGBT, uh, you know, those words and the, the symbols that people use, the rainbow flag, and et cetera, um, they, most people assume that if, you're, if you use that label to refer to yourself, not only are you experiencing same-sex attractions, but you are living uh, as a, a person in homosexual relationship, that you're acting on those attractions and desires. And, um, so, I mean, we have the, the, the responsibility not just to do the right thing, but to, uh, but to help others to see what is right. And so if a person is living the church's teaching on chastity, uh, but the way that they're, defined, they're describing themselves or labeling themselves, leads other people to assume that they're not, well, that's, that's a scandal, right? That's, that's causing confusion. So I would invite people who are kind of, so to speak, on our side of the, the question of chastity, you know, to think again about the language that they're using. Um, and if someone's not living chastely, and that's why they're using that label of gay or LGBT, because they think that the church should bless those unions and, and that there's really no difference and, and that this is a source of grace. Well, then we have a bigger conversation to have, you know. But if we just say, as I've, you know, some clerics have said, you know, well, people deserve to be called what they want to be called. We just call them what they want to be called. Mm -hmm. Then the dialogue's over, right? And we don't have a chance to say, are you doing uh, what God is uh, asking you to do? And are you helping others to see the goodness of that by the way that you speak about yourself and your decisions? And would you say with that same reason, I want you to answer this rather than me answering for you, but... Uh, for, with, with, with that same mindset in terms of, um, obviously as a Catholic, one is opposed to unjust discrimination against uh, anybody, and you've made that case very clear, um, but, um, but similarly, Catholics should, should not, due to the confusion that can be caused and the scandal that can be given, Catholics should or maybe I should say should not to give you the question, but okay, I'll give you a leading question, I guess. The Catholics should not be involved in Pride Month events or Pride marches or, or things like that, as in that, that it, 
I'll let you answer. Yeah, let's. I'll give you the open-ended question. Should Catholics be involved in, in, in Pride Month or Pride events or not? Again, I think it, 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 it matters what we're talking about, right? So if there were an event in the month of June, right, that was a, a dialogue between people on either side, or there's actually, I think, multiple sides of, of the issue here, um, you know, and an opportunity to speak clearly and compassionately about what the church teaches, I, I would go to something like that, you know. Um, if we're talking about pride parades, um, you really have no way to control or even to forecast what's going to happen there. I don't, I think that that uh, pride parades are not a place for children. They're not a place for people who, um, you know, are trying to maintain purity of mind and heart by keeping custody of their eyes and not exposing themselves to, to obscenity and, 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 and vulgar things. I, I think it's just, it's become kind of de rigueur in many, if not all places to, uh, to be transgressive, at least for some people to be transgressive in, in their displays. And um, unless you're absolutely sure that that's not gonna happen, I think it's a risk that's not worth taking, especially when young people are around. Now, some uh, courage members, former courage members, people kind of on our side of things, um, they actually go to their local pride parade uh, and set up a table along the route um, with a sign, you know, that says, you know, the church, the Catholic church loves you uh, or God loves you. And so do we, and, you know, just kind of make themselves available, um, hand out rosaries or mass schedules for local churches, or uh, just be there for conversation. Now there are people who see that and come and mock and spit on them and things like that. But there are other people who, you know, are, you know maybe are kind of swept into marching in the parade by friends, but they're kind of at a point where they're questioning you know, what this all means in terms of their spiritual life. And, and so I think those folks are very uh, heroic in, in being apostolic, getting out there uh, in the place where they can encounter folks who, who have questions and, and need to hear uh, the message of God's mercy and grace. Um, now, I mean, a lot of those folks have been exposed to all this before, right? So it's not, they're not in the same position as, you know, someone who would be uh, really uh, offended and scandalized by what they see. At least I think these guys, they know what, what the possibilities are and they kind of steel themselves against that and, and a lot of prayer and, and a lot of asking for God's grace and, and protection, but they do good work along, along the parade route. Um, so I would say in, in very specific cases, um, it, it might, yeah, there may be a reason to, to go at least to the place where it's happening, if you can give a witness to the truth that the church proclaims, but um, to go and, and advocate for uh, a change in the church's teaching, uh, to, you know, advocate for changes in the law, um, to, you know, uh, or to just kind of, you know, be free and liberated, you know, for the sake of shocking others. You know, that's not something we should ever be involved in, no matter what the topic is. So, to take it from the, 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 the theory, the abstract and the generalities, and let's take it down to a particular, let's take it to a particular scenario. Mm -hmm. And obviously, as you say, the, 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 the church, we're interested in uh, truth, recognizing there's no greater compassion than the compassion of the truth. But we're also, as, as implied by that, interested in compassion, love, um, charity, and combining those two things. Let's say, and there's a thousand different scenarios we could play out, but let's say there was a, uh, a young man in our family or in our uh, parish or in our uh, friend group, could be Catholic, may not be Catholic, but they um, feel that they are there's a possibility they are same-sex attracted. And obviously, as, as you say, uh, the, the general message of Pride Month is, I guess, to them is, number one, come out and become sexually active. I think as the campaign would say, you know, come out, it gets better. Mm -hmm. And that implies sexual activity and, 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 and uh, obviously you're saying the proposition of the church and courage is not psychological or sexual repression, but it's a but it's a but it's a different path, and you're saying that's the path towards peace and happiness and and true freedom. 
So if somebody, you know, if you're, it, it, I guess it would vary on how close you are or what your relationship is this, but let's say the young man, let's say, for example, in your family, it's a nephew, it's a son, it's a grandson. Um, how should, what should people do if they want to, they want to love this person, but they also want, as part of that love, they want to offer them the truth as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we ought to be able essentially to say three things. I love you. I believe God has a plan for your life. And I'd like to hear your story. Right? And uh, this is kind of my spin on, on what Pope Francis says. When it's, we, in life, we must accompany people starting from their situation and accompany them with mercy. Um, so I think the first response when someone comes out to a loved one uh, is to say, thank you. You know, I, I'm really honored and touched. I know this wasn't easy. Um, the fact that you trust me with this part of your life means a lot to me. Um, I still love you as much as I ever have. You know, nothing's going to change that. Um, I still, you're still, you know, my friend, my family member, and nothing's going to change that. Um, and uh, and I'm grateful for the trust that you put in me. I'm, I promise I'm not. I'm going to try everything I can not to betray that trust. So, first to like let someone know that they are loved and accepted, and that your first reaction is not, oh no, what do we do now? <laughs> right? Um, it, that may be your internal reaction, um, but you know, in terms of how we treat one another, we have to be in a position of receptivity, of accompanying them, starting from their situation where they are. Um, trying to avoid words like suffering from or struggling with same-sex attractions or, um, you know, this is a problem and this is how we fix it, you know, even with all the right intentions. I think this happens a lot with parents, you know, when they, when they start to kind of interrogate the child, of, you know, have you heard of, you know, the church teaching? Do you know what it is? Um, you know, uh, have, you, have you heard Father So-and-So's uh, video or have you read, you know, Father So-and-So's book? that sends the message even when it's not intended that their love for me is contingent on me fixing this and figuring it out right and so calm you know peaceful joyful cheerful uh receiving of the person is, is really key then i think the next thing i would say is is it's not i i don't want to say too much because i want to listen first before i speak and this is something that you've been dealing with for a long time and it's all news to me, right? And so, but what I do want to say is I know that this is an important part of your life and this is an important fact about you. I don't think it's the only important fact about you. And honestly, I don't think it's the most important fact about you. You know, when I look at you, I don't see a gay person. I see uh, my son or my daughter, my brother, my sister, my friend. I see someone who's created in God's image and likeness. Uh, they, I believe God created you a man or a woman on purpose because he loves you and he has a plan for your life. Um, I believe that, that you know, Jesus loves you and trusts you with the mission that he's giving you in your life. I, and nothing that you just told me changes any of that either. Um, and I think you know, the best way to be happy is to really kind of live from that starting point. That, you, know, you are in God's mind and heart and in God's hands and he has a plan for your life. And, Eventually, maybe not right now, there's a lot to talk about right now, but may, eventually I'd love to have discussions with you about what that plan is and how it plays out with our sexuality and our relationships. Things like that. So I love you. I believe that has a plan for your life. Then to say, I think, follow, to follow up with that and say, but we don't have to talk about that right now. What I really want to talk about is what's going on in your life. You know, how does this, where, do, where do you feel like this, uh, started and what does it mean and what are you looking for um i want to know you know if it's a person that we don't know well just yet like a pastoral relationship I'd like to hear the story of you know where you come from and and what your family life is like and and what you think of god and what you think god thinks of you and and what you're proud of and and what you are scared of and and what you think your vocation might be like and just i want to hear your story and in the context of listening to your story then you know we would have some opportunity to talk about the rest of the story eventually when you're ready. You know? So I think as far as an initial conversation goes, that's where I would advise people to take it. Um, it's really the pattern of the road to Emmaus, right? The Lord encountered them on the road. 
walked alongside them, listening to them, you know, talking to each other, very upset. Ask them open-ended questions. What are you guys talking about? Right? They react defensively at first, right? Are you the only person that doesn't know what we're talking about? You know, and then he says, well, tell me, what kind of things, what's going on here? And he lets them just kind of tell it in their own words with all the emotion that went along with that. And then once he's listened to them, then he says, okay, I think you are forgetting some things. Um, remember when he told us this, remember when he pointed this out to us from the scriptures, remember when he said that this had to happen. Do you want to go through that and we can talk about it? And then, you know, he opened the scriptures to them, told them the rest of the story, but not until he had let them tell their own story in the dramatic emotional way that they needed to do it. Um, and they felt seen and heard and received by him. Their hearts were burning within them as he opened the scripture and told them, you know, reminded them of the things they had forgotten about themselves and about Jesus. Um, and then, he, then he, through that, conversation, he led them to the sacraments, right? Celebrated Eucharist for them in their own home. Um, so I think if we can follow that pattern, we'll do very well. Are there any, given that this is obviously a, a natural and supernatural endeavor, um, are there any particular saints that people should be looking to either for their intercession or their example um, as, as they attempt to get this right with somebody they, they love so dearly? Oh, for sure. So, um, you know, I think in terms of uh, people who are trying to uh, support and walk with a loved one, um, by the way, I, I should have mentioned we have a part of our apostolate called Encourage, which uh, takes the same kind of approach to providing pastoral support for, for parents, for spouses, siblings, uh, whose uh, loved one who identifies as LGBT generally is not practicing the faith. And so these folks are are asking, how do I keep the faith and, and keep my family intact? So the patron saints of Encourage are St. Monica and St. Augustine, right? Um, Augustine, the kind of the original wild child, uh, you know, and uh, not as far as we know, uh, facing the experience of same-sex attraction, but certainly sexually promiscuous in his youth. And, um, and Monica, you know, did what she could to share the faith with him um, and, uh, and then let him go his own way and without ever stopping her concern, without ever, you know, kind of casting him off or, or forgetting about him, always praying for him. Augustine says later, later in life, you know, that his conversion, everything good that happened to him was from the tears and prayers that his mother shed for him. So I think they're very good uh, models. I think Our Lady and her, her sisters at the, at the foot of the cross, um, you know, she was his mother and she wanted to save him from pain and suffering, but she also knew that God's plan had to go, be worked out step by step. And so, uh, although she couldn't do it herself for him, she could stand by him. She could pray with him, uh, pray and sing uh, to God so that he could hear her and know that he wasn't alone. Um, you know, the, the, the women, the other women at the foot of the cross, Mary, the wife of Clopas, uh, traditionally is the mother of James the Less and uh, Simon and Jude. And Salome, the wife of Zebedee, is the mother of uh, James and James the Greater and John. And so of their five sons and two husbands who were all disciples, um, only one of them was there at the foot of the cross and everyone else had, had abandoned the Lord. And so I think they're, they're good models for anybody who sits in church uh, wondering, why aren't my son why are my children here why why is my my spouse here how do i get them to see what i see you know, we don't leave the lord in order to chase them down but we we stay with the lord and we we put them at the foot of the cross with him um and then the patron saints of courage uh, are the ugandan martyrs saint charles longa and his companions um there's a uh, kind of a complicated story but uh, what where the the persecution of the martyrs began was really in the fact that the, the king, who was only 19 years old, um, you know, he, one of his, his uh, practices was to invite the, the, the boys who uh, served him in the palace uh, to uh, participate in homosexual acts with him. Um, the older uh, Catholics in his court, um, you know, who had some influence over the, the servants, they would keep the Catholic boys away from him. Um, and one day, uh, 
coming home in a, in a rage uh, and finding all his servants had taken the day off, um, you know, one of them came back uh, with one of the Catholic boys and said that he had been to see the priest and in a you know, jealous rage, uh, the, the, the king uh, put a spear through, through the Catholic boy, his name was Dennis, uh, and uh, pinned him to the wall and killed him. And then the next day marched several dozen of them out to the place of execution. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, I mean, their, their, um, their willingness to face death uh, rather than um, uh, give up the faith in, in, in the face of, of a very powerful and uh, like he was an absolute monarch in his kingdom um, and uh, no one crossed him. And they knew that death was certain. And, and nonetheless, some of them, at, just as teenagers, and none of them, I think, were over about 40. You know, all, all the men had a lot to live for, uh, but they, they served God rather than the king and uh, kept their chastity rather than uh, give in to his demands. And so very powerful patrons and intercessors for us uh, at Courage. Um, happily, their, their feast day is June 3rd, right at the beginning of, of Pride Month. And, and for that matter, the month of June has always been the month of the Sacred Heart. Um, and it's really looking to the heart of the Lord. We realize he knows what we feel. He knows what we desire. God doesn't give us unfulfillable desires. You know? And so if there are desires for love and for companionship and for relationship and family and belonging and all those things that are good that God inspires in us, then the Sacred Heart knows how to help us to find those an answer to those desires in good and holy and healthy ways uh, and not in um, on sexual intimacy or any other form of sexual sin or any other form of, of sin. You know, he's, he's inviting us to give him our hearts so that he can make our hearts like his own and fulfill the desires that he puts into the heart of each person. Let's deal with that partic particular point then. You, you made the point that... I'd imagine you must hear from some people, probably primarily Catholics, that God does not give us, you know, whatever desires we have come from God. I'm not endorsing this argument. And if God mm. had given this person a desire to be same-sex attraction, that that is their that is their that is their God-given identity. That is their God-given sexuality. Mm -hmm. You, the church, should respect what God has given them. What do, what do you say in response to that? Well, first of all, it's not just um, uh, lay people uh, who propose that. I mean, there are priests who come right out and say, God made you this way. Um, and um, theologically speaking, that's an impossibility um, because we're, it's, it's very clear, uh, both in sacred scripture and the teaching of the church, and just in the way that the human body is created and the way that human hearts and minds and relationships work naturally. Um, you know, this God's plan for marriage and God's plan for sexuality um, is written in the human heart and body. It's written in the scriptures and in the teaching of the church. Um, it's been revealed to us and, and it belongs to each of us by the fact of our being human, uh, by the fact of being created in his image and likeness, our relationships have to be permanent and faithful and, and self-giving by the fact of being created male and female. They're based on complementarity and procreativity. And so there's that goes extraordinarily deep into the, the nature of the human person. It is the at the heart of Christian anthropology. So if we were to say that God makes some people uh, to have a homosexual orientation, um, I think one of two things would have to follow from that, neither of which is acceptable from a theological point of view. One would be that although Revelation tells us that this plan of God involving complementary procreativity is part of the fundamentals of our human nature uh, and applies to every person, um, that there are in fact some people to whom it does not apply, in fact, who, to whom the opposite applies, um, that for them, complementary and procreativity form no part of their sexual relations, um, which would imply that there's a God's creating a different kind of human being, a different kind of human nature, and therefore a different kind of natural morality. Um, God can do anything, but God can't contradict himself. Um, and so if we were to say, to take it from that perspective, 
we'd have to say God isn't God and we don't have the, the shared human dignity and solidarity that we have always believed that we had, that um, you know, everything's arbitrary and there are no you know, constants. And granted, I mean, that's very easy for a person who's relativistic like most modern people are to say, but, but from a, an, a, an authentic Catholic point of view, it's, it's unacceptable. God doesn't uh, suddenly do the opposite of what he's revealed to be his will. Uh, and God doesn't create different different kinds of human beings. So what's the alternative? That God creates, uh, forms a human being to, and, and decides to give that person a homosexual orientation um, and basically saying in the process, you must never ever act on the desires that I'm giving to you um, or you can't be in relationship with me. My will is that you never, that you do one thing and I'm giving, I'm making you have a desire to do the opposite. Um, so the, this is your position and I put you there. Like that monster is not the God that we believe in, a God that would set us up with unfulfillable desires, set, set a person up to fail or, or at least to be frustrated. You know, St. James uh, in his letter in the New Testament says, God tempts no one, right? And so, you know, if we perceive the tr that, you know, if, if, if the church's teaching is true about the nature of homosexual acts, um, then it's not possible that God would give us a give a person a desire to do something that is gravely immoral. Right? Um, so where does it come from? Well, that's an open question. Right? I think it's a very complicated question. Um, and I think in respect to God, we would say, you know, it's it's what some authors call God's permissive will that there are. You know, once he creates the human being, um, he lets us go our way and, and he respects our freedom for the sake of our being able to love him. He accepts the fact that some people use their freedom to sin, uh, that, that things can go wrong in terms of human physical development, human emotional development. Um, he accepts those things, which is not to say that he desires or is pleased by them, but he allows those to occur. And there are many different factors that can. Um, that can be part of this experience in a person's life. But to say that God makes a person that way, that someone's born that way, or you know, God made them that way, it just doesn't fit with what we believe about ourselves and about God. I don't know the, the extent to which this is the remit of, of courage, if you go there or, or, or not, but you say it's a, a complex question, so that makes it sound like an interesting question. Um, you know, what, what would be your take or what is your take as regards, therefore, the, the, the provenance or the roots of the genesis of same-sex attraction in mm -hmm. a person. And I'd imagine that, that, that varies depending on whether male, female, and other factors as well. But, you know, what, what's, your, what's your take or analysis? For sure. That? So uh, the, the church's position uh, is, ex is ex expressed in the catechism where it says that the psychological genesis of homosexuality remains largely unexplained, right? And I think, I think that's that's a good answer from the church because the church is not doing psychology, not doing sociology, not doing medicine. The church is is talking about uh, theology and philosophy, um, and um, and so I think that's probably the only thing the church will, will ever say, um, and will lead will leave the the you know a better answer to that question to scientists who study this from various angles right now i'm not a medical doctor i'm not a psychologist i can read studies and understand them mostly you know um but so i mean i think our position as an apostolate is is to respect the church's reticence on that and um, frankly i think it's not as important uh where uh where this experience comes from as where do we go from here you know Having said that, um, I think we can look to science to help us form a better understanding of the situation. Um, for a long time, the question of a genetic origin of homosexuality uh, was kind of an open question. Uh, at the end of 2019, there was a, uh, a, uh, a large study, it goes by the acronym, acronym GWAS, uh, Genome Wide uh, association study, I think is what it's called. So um, whereas previous searches for the quote unquote gay gene, you know, were uh, mostly what they call convenient samples, 
uh, people volunteered to be part of the study. Um, the authors of this study took, I think, 100,000 um, randomized genetic profiles uh, from, uh, from the UK and the US um, and Sweden, I think. Um, basically, from they, they bought data from places like 23andMe and Ancestry.com who do this genetic testing for people and ask them all sorts of questions. So what they did first is they, they filtered out all the people who identified as LGBT. And then they, uh, they looked to see, are there any uh, similarities among them that stand out as opposed to the general population? And they found, I think, five or eight different uh, genetic markers in different parts of the genome that seemed to be more common among people who identified themselves as LGBT. Um, then they went to do it in reverse and said, all right, so is this a predictive thing? If we know that a person has these markers, are they going to turn out to identify as LGBT? Um, and they found in that respect that it really only accounted for, I think, between eight and 25% uh, accuracy uh, in predicting from someone's genome that this would be their experience. So they concluded and said, the idea that there is you know, a gay gene or several gay genes that are predictive in every case doesn't seem to pan out. That obviously this is very, very complex and it requires a lot more research. And also we have to understand you know, what, what things come from genetics and, and what things you know, are influenced by other things that are related to genetics, et cetera. So um, it was a really important study even though it didn't come to very clear conclusions because it's a, we've really looked at a lot of different people and you, know, you have to know that this is not as easy as pointing to this or that part of the genome. Um, so that's from the medical side of things. From the psychological side of things, the American Psychological Association, if you go on their website and look up what causes a, a particular orientation, um, what they say is, I think, very frank and honest and, and very true to my experience. There's no consensus among scientists uh, about any particular, that there's any particular factor, or particular combination of factors that's re that is the, the cause of sexual orientation in all people. That uh, most scientists agree that both, uh, both um, biological and psychological and sociological uh, reasons, you know, will, will interact uh, in a person's life. Um, they, most scientists would say that it's not a choice. I think the church agrees with that. Uh, to not something that someone chooses to to experience, but um, but even the psychologists are saying there's not there's not a one size fits all explanation, which is why I think it's so important, you know, in a pastoral situation and it's even in a family, you know, to start with a, a receptiveness to letting someone tell his or her own story and and not trying to tell them, you know, what their what the origins of this has to be or what their problem is, you know, but to listen uh, as they they tell their story and and try to explain what they're looking for and if they're finding it or not, and then help them to, to understand what God's plan is for the desires that they're feeling. And in terms of, sorry to draw you into another speculative answer, I, 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 I guess, but you know, there, there, there was a time as you identify when uh, not so long ago where there would not have been public manifestations um, of uh, same-sex attraction, uh, the LGBT movement, Pride Month, parades, and everything else, that that would not have happened. Mm -hmm. um, given this greater level of prominence, does that suggest that the prevalence or the, the, the percentage of those in society who experience same-sex attraction has increased in recent decades, um, or is it, there's just greater visibility, uh, or, or what? And feel free not to answer if that's a ludicrously speculative and silly question. <laughs> no, it, well, I mean, there's there's a couple aspects to it, of course. I think you know you look at stories of um, the ancient world, and you see that you know there was homosexual behavior going on, you know, in in various aspects of of pretty decadent societies, you know, starting with the Greeks and Romans and down through the centuries. It's only in the 19th century that people started to write about um, homosexuality as kind of a more or less stable disposition, something that 
forms a person's personality. I think it's only in the 60s and 1960s and 70s that um, you know people started to kind of claim that as an identity. So you know clearly there have always been people who have experienced these attractions, um, uh, and to one extent or another, they're more visible now. Um, you know, I think um, another part of uh, what's going on is um, just the the way that having labels and uh, an identity and solidarity and kind of a group to belong to and a way to describe oneself is su is super attractive, right? Um, you know, if there's there's and there there are increasingly today more and more specific subgroups of, um, you know, LGBTQ plus, um, you know, the plus includes an awful lot of things like asexuality, pansexuality, uh, biromanticism, um, uh, demisexuality, you know, all sorts of, of very recently coined uh, ways of describing oneself. Um, a lot of them have a specific color schemes and flags to put on your website and your Facebook profile, et cetera. Um, and I think teenagers have always um, had big questions that they have to answer, basically two of them, who am I and, and what is sex about? And you know, we've had in our society until very, very recently, um, structures in family and school and church you know, to help people navigate those two questions. Um, I think because we are very fragmented as a society, because no one wants to listen to anyone else's messy situation, um, you know, now we just tell young people, well, you answer one question with the other. When you find out who you're attracted to, then that's who you are. And so I think young people especially are much more uh, likely to take on labels uh, than, their, than preceding generations were and to label themselves in terms of sexual attraction. Um, there was a study from the, the Pew Research Institute. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It was from a, an LGBT activist group a couple of years ago um, that came out with a very surprising headline that 25% of millennials identify as LGBT. Now, this was very surprising because typically uh, from public health uh, surveys uh, in the US and, and other Western countries, um, the typical level of male homosexuality is about 3% of the general population. Female homosexuality, about 1.5% of the general population. That's been steady for a long time. Um, so this was at an order of magnitude higher, right, in, among millennials. But when you break it down into, like, what they specifically answered, um, the, those who identified as homosexual, it was still 3%. And then another, I think, 10 or 13% were in categories like um, bisexual, uh, pansexual, asexual, queer, questioning, unsure, right? And I think what that, what that means is that there are a lot more people today who have serious questions about who they are, where they fit, how to navigate relationships, how to understand their sexuality, um, that most of them are, are questioning rather than necessarily kind of locked into uh, a particular way of looking at themselves. But, um, you know, if we don't take their questions seriously, then what they hear from other people is, as you say, just be out and proud and that'll make you happy. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think the just the way that our society expects us all to claim a, an identity, but doesn't really help us to, to do that well, uh, is probably to blame for a lot of what seems like the explosion in, in homosexuality today. Father Bachansky, I know you've been very generous in giving us your time, uh, which is one hour, and from hearing the uh, the, the clock tolling, ask, yes. not, for, ask yes. not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee, and it tolls for, for me. Um, so let's bring this into to land. That seems like our 60 minutes is, is up. And um, so I guess the final question, which possibly for many people listening, watching, is the most important question. If they want to know more about courage, what do they do? So we have two websites, uh, Courage RC, the RC stands for Roman Catholic, uh, courage, CourageRC.org uh, is our website for our members, uh, both uh, Courage and Encourage. Uh, they can find testimonies there, uh, talks from our uh, conferences, articles that our members have written, et cetera. And then the other is uh, truthandlove.com. A-N-D also is spelled out there, truthandlove.com is a resource library that we have for people in ministry, 
for people in healing professions, for educators to understand better how to welcome and accompany people in this situation. And um, we have a, an annual conference. It's coming up in July at Benedictine College in Kansas. Uh, it'll be both in person and online. And so uh, members and potential members of the apostolate uh, will be there for sure, but also chaplains, uh, people in pastoral ministry, people who want to understand more about who we are and what we do are all very invited to uh, to take part. Um, registration closes on July the 1st, though, so it may be, I don't know when when your podcast will air, but uh, if not this year, then, then in the future, but uh, video presentations will be, will be available online as well uh, shortly after the conference is over. So couragerc.org, truthandlove.com. Well, we'll get this podcast out this week, so it'll be in time, and we'll put all those links into whatever we put this uh, out. Fantastic. Final uh, question, as you identify the month of June is um, the month of the Sacred Heart. Um, I just wonder if you would lead us in a prayer and give you a blessing to draw all to the Sacred Heart of Christ, but especially our brothers and sisters um, who are same-sex attracted, who obviously we, we love and and wish to bring along with ourselves closer to the sacred heart of Christ. Surely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, you commanded us to behold your sacred heart, which so loves the human race, your heart, which is on fire for love of us, which is pierced for love of us, which has suffered so much out of love for us. Help us to find hope and confidence uh, in beholding your sacred heart, that you truly know who we are, what we feel, what we desire, what we need, and that in your limitless love for us, you will always provide for those needs in the way that, that suits us best and that leads us uh, to the flourishing and the fulfillment and the freedom that we desire for all of your all of your brothers and sisters whom you redeemed by the blood that you shed from that heart. Sacred heart of Jesus, Jesus meek and humble of heart, make our hearts like unto thine. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father Philip Machansky, Executive Director of Courage, thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. It's a pleasure.